Good morning, world. Thank you for coming. It's a big pleasure to serve you the new edition of the Elpa Performance International Congress. And I want to thank uh, to comedy, in particular, Bokin Asbar, for his invitation. My name is Julio Calleja. I'm coming from Spain. And in the last uh, 45 minutes, we talk about one of the most hot topics in the field of export science, and in particular in basketball, recovering basketball from science and practice. For this occasion, we have uh, two international speakers, two big names in the world, with a lot of experience in basketball. In one hand, we have an, uh, Dr. Stephen Baer from Australia. Steve is a PhD, master degree as well, and now he's the athlete Hell and performance lead of the basketball New Zealand senior national teams. He has a lot of experience in professional basketball, and he's associate professor and sport and exercise university of Southern Queensland in Australia, and former export scientist of the Australian National Basket League. Good morning, Steve. Hello, Julio. Thank you very much for the opportunity and. Uh, chairing this particular session. Uh, I'd like to, to thank the committee uh, first and foremost, so the EPLA, Performance International Committee, uh, and obviously the uh, EuroLeague Players Association uh, Performance Advisory Board for the opportunity. And, and of course, um, I would like to thank all of my colleagues and collaborators, so Meta Singh, uh, obviously yourself, Julio, uh, Leonard King, the General Manager of Basketball New Zealand, and our PhD students who do a lot of work in the area of, of basketball and performance, Thomas Hayo, uh, Jordan uh, Godfrey, and Ernest De La Angelis. Thanks so much, Steve. Really appreciate it. This is a big pleasure for us. And on the other hand, we have Made Mikhailovic from Serbia, excellent practitioner, a lot of experience on the core. He's a master's degree in high performance sport at the university. And now he's the head strength and conditioning coach of the Virtus Bologna in Italy and former head of strength and conditioning of many teams, Radestad in Belgrade, Partizan, Bayern Munich in German, and for sure, Serbian national teams in a lot of international championships. Good morning, Madden. Thank you for coming out. Good morning, Julio. Good morning, Steve. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I want to thanks also to the ELPA. I want to, to say that I'm really honored to be part of this great project of this conference. And at least if I can share a little bit of my experience and my knowledge through all these years, and if somehow I can help to the colleagues, the players, even the team members, whoever. Uh, so I'm really glad to be with you guys and to enjoy. Thank you, Malin. It's a refresher for us as well. So we can move. Recovering basketball, move faster from exciting to practice, and we will talk about it in the next minutes. Thank you very much, Julio. So there are, we, let's start with a, a systems review. So there are several systems that require recovery and regeneration with multiple recovery strategies frequently applied in practice and scientifically evaluated in research that can be broadly termed into four key system themes. Those are the locomotor system, the energetic system, our neuromuscular system, and the psychological system. Now, within these four systems, there are several strategies that have been researched. These include cold water immersion, contrast water therapy, stretching, whole body chirotherapy, compression garments, massage, intermittent pneumatic compression, electrostim, sauna and infrared therapies, sleep, nutrition, and hydration. But along with those, we also have the psychological recovery strategies such as cognitive self-regulation, positive suggestion, creative visualization, anchoring, and relaxation techniques. So from a scientific perspective, we would look at these particular areas that have a potential to affect short-term recovery and benefits, and these have been reported to apply to the above listed strategies in relation to muscular recovery, substrate recovery, neural recovery, and psychological recovery. However, ultimately, there are three factors that should direct your choice of recovery strategies. These being the efficacy of the strategy, the accessibility to players and staff, 
and the acceptance of athletes in the context of your environment. The most successful recovery programs have one thing in common, and those are they center on educating players through the recovery process. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a very good approach. It's the real state of the art nowadays, and now we have to try to translate this scientific knowledge directly on a field. Hi, Mare. What do you think about it? Which are the most interesting ideas based on scientific knowledge? Uh, I mean, definitely, definitely what Steve presented now, uh, I would. I would always start from this basic. Uh, there's a pretty uh, wide area that we need to cover when we talk about uh, recovery. Uh, it's not just one system. There is a, There are different systems that we need to think about considering the recovery process. Everything starts from the different systems that we load and uh, also those systems we need to recover. All these systems, they have a different time frame, so uh, maybe locomotor system needs a more time comparing to energetic system to recover or neuromuscular system more time to recover than locomotor system. Uh, I would always start from, from this point of view and to make a difference between these systems. Uh, also, uh, trying to, to implement uh, this theory working with the players and to try to educate them to understand how complex uh, recovery process is. So we need, we need to be educated. I mean, it's a science-based approach that we need to transfer to, to our players. Definitely, definitely starting, starting from, this point, from this point of view. Uh, Thank you very much. It's a good perspective from practitioners. How is Steve? What is the real perception about the other guys inside the scenario? Of course, talking about the real scenario in basketball. That's a great question, Julio. And I think we start with our approach from the recovery pyramid. And we have termed this approach the 90-10. Now, as we aim to educate players using the recovery 90-10 principle, this is built on three pillars. And those pillars being sleep, nutrition, and psychological well-being. Now, on top of that, our key here, though, is to make sure there is a significant amount of literature that looks at the sleep process within athletes. And it is one of the underpinning areas that we try and educate our players on because it has such an impact on all facets of recovery. Following which, we then look at topping up the other 10% with all of the other types of modalities. Now, these modalities could be what we term the one percenters that count in the field. This approach is then implemented through a recovery point system. And our recovery point system really looks at educating the players by providing an overall numerical weighting for the different recovery strategies. We first designed this recovery checklist for athlete education tool with the Indonesian Olympic team for Beijing in 2008. The goal is for the athlete to accrue a certain number of recovery points over that period of time. We've since used this with multiple sports from basketball through to elite Olympic athletes. Nice picture and thank you very much because it's uh, the real uh, things that we can use uh, always from a didactical point of view in order to serve to our mates in teams and players as well. What do you think about it, Mother? I think I think it's a it's a it's a great great idea, definitely. Uh, I mean, as much tools as you have, uh, definitely you can do more things. Uh, this pyramid ninety ten uh, looks very simple, uh, but uh, we need to consider what is the main thing. So if we if we look to the pyramid, so like what is the ninety percent? Area that cover the recovery process. I would start from from the point that uh, at least we are humans. I mean, when we when we talk about uh, players, the first thing they are humans, so we need to do some basic basic stuff that will cover this area. The other ten percent, I mean, the, the rest 
of this pyramid, the 10% is everything that we can do in a club. And I think this, this relation uh, uh, presents the real picture uh, of the recovery process. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know the player that can perform well if didn't sleep well, or if didn't eat well, or is not in a well-being condition. Even if they do all these uh, things of recovery, such as ice bath, uh, conscious therapy, massage, but if they don't, um, if they don't cover this 90%, there is no way that they will perform uh, perfectly. They will not even maintain the performance on the high level if they don't respect the first three things that are on the bottom of this pyramid. Thank you. It's a good point of view. So if we consider these all tools in order to give more uh, practice, we have to start analyzing which are the main difficulties which are the main knowledge, which are the main advantage we can get when we use different tools or toys that we have get on a market. Yes, Steve, we can continue yes. with So in relation to, as uh, extending on one of Aladdin's point around individual athletes, in this particular graphic, we have the recovery points that the athlete has accrued over a 48 hour period with an Australian National Basketball League team. The green dots represent individual players with the number of points that they were able to accrue in 48 hours. The red dot is the mean for the entire group. Now, as practitioners in the field, we are always thinking about player wellness. And we look at several subjective markers of that, whether that be they rating their level of sleep, their level of soreness, uh, their level of energy. Now, in this graphic, we can see that in the 48 hour period, comparison to the player wellness itself. Now, when we highlight this, our goal is to have our players at a subjective player wellness score above 65%. And when we um, run in this particular scenario, a regression analysis, we can see that around the 30 points for the player will have them in line where they can accrue um, a 65% in their player wellness. So this is a practical example of how we would use the recovery tools for them to accrue their recovery points and allowing us as practitioners from a scientific perspective to identify how many recovery points will be related to subjective wellness. But the serious part of this is how does this look in practice? And the example we will provide for you is this example from Jimmy Butler, where Jimmy Butler talks about complete readiness is an around the clock process. And for Jimmy, in this off-season preparation example, every hour is mapped out. And when you look at everything that Jimmy does in this example from 4 a.m. with workouts down to uh, substrate, to recovery, to nap, all the way through to 7 p.m., the reoccurring theme is the emphasis that Jimmy places on including recovery-type modalities to ensure that he's ready to perform in his next session. And Jimmy has been um, quoted as saying in this example, it's a rhythm, it's a routine, and I don't skip any of it. I don't skip any step in the process. I eat when I'm supposed to eat, I sleep when I'm supposed to sleep, and I play dominoes when I'm supposed to do that. So the individual factor is quite important based on the context of the athlete and the environment. Sounds good, Steve, thank you very much, because there are two key points. First of all, how analyze the wellness and recovery radio is very important. And second one, how we apply during daily routine with players and including all the strategies in order to serve them the best way and education for the rest of the career. So my main question is, Madden, how can we apply every single day a ratio between wellness and recovery. And on the other hand, it is possible when we are playing at home, when we are playing away, to include all little details in the daily routine? I mean, the, fir the first question, uh, uh, definitely uh, we need to, we need to, to do a load management uh, so that we, we can know exactly uh, how much work we did. Uh, with the load management, we know how much we stressed our players and we know uh, what kind of fatigue will happen. Uh, 
uh, also we can know um, how much fatigue will happen. And as I said, there will be a different time frame of the recovery process after, which will be definitely the adaptation. Uh, that's the first thing which is which is really important. And uh, for this system that uh, Steve talked uh, about, Jimmy Butler's schedule, uh, it's very important to set a to set a system uh, where player will uh, expect. Uh, what they need to do during the day. The schedule is very is very important. They should be informed uh, when they will have practice, when they will lift, when they when they have travel, so they can they can plan also their their uh, their time because it's not about only the time that they will spend in the gym. It's very important what they will do off the court, how they they will prepare for the practice, how they they will prepare their body. Um, how they will recover their body after the practice uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a pretty complex uh, question. Uh, involves uh, the whole staff. Uh, yeah, it asks players to be involved in this process proactive. They need to think about their body. Their body is their office, definitely. Uh, as much as they maintain their body and keep them uh, on the higher level, they can they can definitely perform on the higher level. Uh, and uh, about the second the, about the second question, can you please repeat it one more time? Yeah, it's very simple. Basing on this schedule, we have to consider all little details uh, through the daily routine. My question is. Uh, every single day are different because we have to play at home, because we have to play away, weeks with two or three weeks, weeks with two or three games as well. So sometimes we have to change. On one hand, we are considering one single day and list. But on the other hand, we have to change because the timetables are different and the weeks are different as well because the capacity of adaptive daily is very important. So we have to change the office every single day. So there are many problems uh, with teams in order to get the ideal office for each player. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, everything is happening so quick. One day you play at home, uh, the other day you play away. Uh, one day you have a charter flight. The other day you have to we have to go with a with a long layover, uh, playing uh, away games. And definitely you need to to adapt. Everything is coming from a, from a good planning process, uh, the the management of the of the team, so that you and you you must be available. You must be uh, able to to adjust every single every single plan. Um, uh, for a, for a benefit of the player, you have to know when you're going to arrive somewhere, how much time you have to sleep. Are you going to miss the night? Are you going to fly during the night? When you're going to wake up in the morning? Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, practiced so early because they give you they give you the time schedule. Uh, you have to decide if you're going to do that practice or not. If it's an early game. Uh, Will you practice or not? Uh, uh, what after the game? Do you have enough time to stay in the facility or you will organize the recovery in a hotel? How many physiotherapists you have on the road game? Uh, what tools you can bring there? I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really complex and it's really, it's really wide, wide area that we need to think, think about. Uh, yeah, thank, yeah I, I understand perfectly. Thank you very much for your uh, opportunities in the field on a court are, are very important. Steve, there are a lot of interesting things to consider before starting to apply the most adequate um, recovery method. Please explain us what is the exciting point of view. Just extending on from Aladdin, I think one of the, one of the key issues is around the demands of travel. And if we just look at this, this sample, in relation to the NBA, we know there's 82 reg season games, 28 in the playoff. But the serious issue here is the volume of travel. And if you look here in this specific example, the, the trailblazers themselves are clocking up around 54,000 miles. 
And if we look at Major League Baseball, they're a little bit lower than that. Now, why that is significant, the Earth's circumference is like 29,000 miles. So they're almost traveling, you know, one and a half times around, around the globe. And that's of interest because recently we have seen an increase in injuries that have occurred. And there has been a lot of interest in the impact that travel has on players' overall health and wellness. And if you look at some uh, notable trainers saying that the travel miles, sleeping on planes and hotels for months on end, playing 82 regular season games in 170 days, takes its toll on the players. And with that in mind, unfortunately, we will never really see what these guys can do because they're always tired all of the time because of the schedule. And I think Malan, his previous point was alluding to the issues around travel. Thanks so much, Steve. In fact, travel fatigue exists. And sometimes we have to consider we are doing wrong when the athletes presents more fatigue on a plane than, than playing or, or on a practice. Yeah. What do you consider about it, Madden? And, and how uh, is the most uh, successful management in this type of, of, of details? about uh, the trips, especially on, on congestion and schedules. And nobody, nobody talks about trips. Uh, definitely everybody talks about uh, the basketball playing activity and everybody talk how we need to recover from the activity of, of a basketball game. But uh, like this number looks amazing, uh, you know, like 44,000 miles NBA. I would like to have these numbers in uh, European basketball. Uh, I'm not sure if somebody analyzed this, but uh, definitely is a, is a huge issue. Uh, different different budgets, budget that we face comparing to the NBA. And I don't know, Steve, was the was the situation in Australia? But uh, you know, a lot of teams they don't they don't travel with the with the charter flights. You know, they spend a lot of time on the airports, waiting. And this is the main point: like how many how many hours um, we sit. So players in a seated position, you know, it's like four or five hours flight with a, with a layover, uh, coming to the airport, coming from the airport, you know, is a, is a, is a pretty passive position. And I think, you know, like uh, the posture change, the, um, the breathing depth, the breathing uh, rate, everything, everything is, uh, is influenced by, by, by this problem. And I would like to, to see you know, to compare maybe even uh, like conditions from different countries, like teams that play in Russia, play in Spain, and you know, the distances that they cover is, is really tough to, for players to, to, to stay fit, to stay uh, uh, healthy and to, to follow this. I think that the club need to also to invest a little bit, to a little bit more because like playing in, in Europe is really tough. Every, every single game, there is a lot of pressure, uh, you know, is in or out. What I like to say, there is a, there is a high impact also on the, on the nervous system. Uh, how we try to, to help the players, like during the trips, you know, we usually we bring some of the tools and like all the toys on the plane, like a foam rollers, uh, trigger point balls, we suggest them and try to educate them to give them some advice if they can release some muscle, if they can stretch uh, to stand up and to spend some time out of seated position uh, because blood flow, because of posture and so on and so on. I mean, these are like small suggestions that we always try to, to give to our players. Definitely, you know, sometimes if they choose to sleep, of course, we will let them sleep because the lack of the sleep is one of the, of the biggest problem like in a modern basketball. Yeah, for sure. In fact, the biggest step probably is the private flight. However, we have considered all little details in order to reduce travel fatigue during all processes. Thank you very much, Madel. Good, good, good ideas uh, uh, in order to explain with more detail what is the real life of the top basketball players. Steve, is there anything new or something new detail about the next one? or you have to consider other little future research lines in this topic? Certainly, and I think Milan touched on a really impertinent point, that being the postural alterations of excessive seated and traveling. And we're gonna look at areas such as the iliopsoas muscle group, um, diaphragmatic compression, 
and then upper thoracic um, issues around hypertonicity across the shoulders and the neck, uh, sternocleidomastoid, moving up into the occipital, that whole area does end up in a high state of hypertonicity. And that's where one of the most common therapies is around soft tissue treatment and specifically self myofascial release or SMR. Uh, in that regard, soft tissue therapies are extensively used in elite basketball, especially the SMR techniques there's several proposed benefits of uh, SMR techniques, including reducing local fatigue, reducing muscular uh, excitability, reducing or uh, inducing relaxation, mood enhancement, improving joint range of motion, and obviously postural resetting. Uh, fortunately, we were involved in a research group that actually examined the impact of foam rolling as a recovery tool following eccentric exercise and explored potential mechanisms underpinning changes related to jump performance. There were improvements in counter movement jump at 72 hours uh, post, along with small to moderate effects observed at 48 hours post training. Most notably, the pain tolerance also improved at 48 hours, and these effects were observed at 24 hours post as well. However, Despite this, there was no clear evidence of any neural contribution to this improvement in counter movement jump. And we know that this may at least be in part facilitated by increases in pain tolerance. Notably, players always reported feeling better after SMR. So for us, soft tissue management would be one of the mainstays that we would use and looking at a variety of modalities. So from from roller to vibrating units, to um, looking at a trigger point uh, guns, trigger point therapy. There's a, a range of soft tissue techniques that we can be applying both in travel and at the hotel and at the venue for the game. Thank you, Steve. Good scientific approach. In fact, we are very skeptical about uh, fun role, a significant change. Probably we need a good meta-analysis in the next years in order to understand better the most uh, adequate effects, not only of myofascial and tendons as well, because it's very interesting too. However, there are a lot of little details in order to consider Madden. One of my best reflections during the last years in, in basketball is how the players apply the same protocol before and after practice with the same tool. Uh, in, in my opinion, we have to understand that there are two different uh, targets, there are two different goals, and uh, the protocols are exactly the same. And how is your experience with different type of fan roles, with vibration, with different um, uh, ideas, we include in one or two legs, or uh, with uh, uh, focus on tendons, focus on uh, insertions, or, or in the middle of the muscle, you know? Tell us, explain us, which is your experience on a core when you apply this tool with players? Yeah, definitely. Good, good point and good observation. Um, I mean, uh, definitely there are players that just copy and paste something from the past. And there are players that really wants to, to learn uh, uh, and to understand the main point of, uh, of different procedures. Uh, uh, what we do, and our, in my experience, I mean, uh, cannot be the same process before and after activity, definitely. Uh, I mean, there, there are goals uh, before activity, what we want to do with the soft tissue, but also what we want to do after the, after the activity. Uh, the pre-activation, uh, the main goal is definitely to prepare body for, uh, for the activity, you know, to treat the soft tissue on a certain way, to facilitate muscles, to, to increase the blood flow, to warm up the muscle. But on the other hand, uh, the, after the activity is a, totally different, is a totally different approach. So I'm not a big fan of uh, foam rolling after the activity. I would like uh, more to, to, to approach it from the side of physiotherapists, there are much more effective uh, procedures uh, such as different types of massage, uh, the graston techniques that will, that will uh, influence and uh, the, the fascial, fascial treatment. Uh, 
some kind of mobilization, uh, releasing the tension in the muscles, tendons, uh, opening joints, and trying to, to put the soft tissue in a, I like to say like in maintaining condition. As close as we keep the soft tissue uh, closer to the to the to the um, uh, like a normal optimum level, it would be better. As we know, like uh, if we if we start to accumulate the fatigue, so after one practice, after two practices, after three practices, after cumulative effect, and we don't have time to recover the soft tissue, definitely we will develop some different patterns of movements. Then the perform performance will be, be uh, worse because uh, the, we will spend more energy for the same movement than if it works properly. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of, of foam rolling. Definitely the soft tissue treatment is really important in the recovery, but I would approach it uh, with, a, with a different tools, such as a different kind of massage, different kind of the soft tissue treatments as a, uh, myofascial release, uh, active uh, muscle release, uh, even stretching, which I think is really is really beneficial. But like foam rolling, no. Thank you so much. This is your opinion, and, and I consider. However, uh, in the balance of the science and practice, we have uh, uh, to consider the next ideas: is transportable, is cheap. Players like, and it's not difficult to. However, we have to consider because the balance is very important. In the next six or five years, when we get more intervention studies to compare with control groups, we will see the fair results about the effectivity of the fun rules variants on basketball performance and recovery. Thanks so much, Nadi. Steve, anything new? Something else about it? Yes, certainly. I think the next one is, especially in the current times with everything that is happening uh, globally at the moment, mindfulness has become a key part of not just athletes' life, but I think every everyday life. And we know that mindfulness helps to develop clarity in, in a sporting setting and improve the team's ability to execute, its ability to change direction confidently in the present moment, and allows players really to control emotional reactivity. Now, previously we have been able to implement uh, some mindfulness work in the National Basketball League in Australia with a particular player. And what we were looking at doing was seeing whether we could improve the player's free throw shooting percentage. Now, what we engaged the player in was some fixated gazing and cognitive anchoring activities on the free throw line. And we were able to observe a 37% improvement in three free throw shooting performance following implementation of anchoring centering strategies. Now, really, what does this do? It allows the players to reduce internal noise by anchoring to the task and remain present in the current moment by regaining focus and reducing their attentional field, reducing negative emotional reactiveness and promoting, promoting a sense of calm and clarity. Now, the other area of mindfulness, which is quite of interest, Leo, is that of developing emotional wellness. Now, we know that this is a key component, and it's a person's ability to cope with daily circumstances and deal with the personal feelings in a positive, optimistic manner. And we've successfully used several approaches, and there's some apps that are available that are, that are quite relevant. But in relation to what we've done on the court, We've really looked at four key areas, and that is one, performance flow. How can we achieve this? And that's through obtaining clarity and situational awareness. We look at our attentional field, so reducing our attentional field and controlling our emotions. If we can control emotional reactiveness, we can manage these emotional reactions on court. And then ultimately, we try and achieve a blue mind flow state which is described as a deep calmness and flow in task. Thanks so much, Steve. Good approach. Always brain uh, ideas are uh, very important in our life, not only on performance. And when we have uh, to translate this type of activities to players, maybe we have uh, to explain some difficulties 
uh, through the process. How is your experience about this type of uh, techniques, Mar? My experience is not so, is not so big uh, with uh, with this type of, uh, of of the process. Uh, I think this is one area that uh, at least is covered with a like a psychological approach. Definitely, uh, definitely, um, uh, we need to try to. Um, Uh, consider, you know, uh, listen, or maybe, I, I don't know, sometimes this, this type of, the, the, the main problem is, uh, in fact, uh, the sport science around, there are many different topics in, in this particular activities, uh, psychologists are the experts, and sometimes they combine with, with our knowledge, uh, one uh, high impact packet, you know, on a player or on a coaches as well. So, uh, my experience in, in that field is, is, is very positive because in, in our teams, always there is a guy who organizes and implement these tools through the day, always in touch with the coach. And uh, my impression is during the day, during the long day, the players need some cut, some different spaces, 15 minutes, no more in order to get a good mindfulness in an adequate space, in a chill out uh, place for them, in order uh, to share and, and get a good vagal situation and good relax because the, 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 the top level basketball leagues are, are very, very stressful, you know? So I think that we have studied a lot more in, in that way and probably Steve in the next year uh, in order to uh, connect uh, with some experts on the field, we cut concrete more uh, little details and give more a better solution for players. Anything else, Steve, about other tools or other methods that we have uh, to consider in, in the recent years? Yes, definitely. I think chirotherapy is one of the, the tools that a lot of teams have been using recently. And really one of the most well-established physiological responses to cold exposure is triggered by a decrease in skin temperature, uh, probably stimulating con continuous receptors and the sensory afferents to excite sympathetic uh, androgenic fibers, in turn causing constriction of the local arterioles and, and venules. Now with the research around this type of therapy, which involves a brief bout, a brief exposure, one and a half minutes to three minutes of minus 110 to, to 190 degrees, there has been some research looking particularly um, at serum concentration of muscle injury markers, so prostaglandins and creatine kinase. And the graphic will show that both of these markers are reduced post chirotherapy. And then also along with those, the bottom panel is really looking at um, some of the changes with the pro-oxidant and antioxidant ratios as far as having the total plasma oxidant status within players also are decreasing. Now with this, there's, there's preliminary evidence to support the effects of this anti-inflammatory, anti-analgesic and antioxidant effect. But I think from Alan Julio looking at new trends, I think a lot of the work around chirotherapy these days is not necessarily about post recovery, but potentially is this a novel preparatory intervention prior to competition? And there are a lot of clubs and a lot of teams that are trying to utilize this to invigorate some of the acute hormonal responses, some perceptual and physiological responses before going into um, a game situation. And quickly, what I would like to do is uh, just play a little clip from the Phoenix Suns and their use of chirotherapy pre-game. Coolest interview I ever had. <laughs> So it appears that you put yourself in a refrigerator. What are you doing today? I'm uh, getting ready for the game. It's a uh, big game today, so uh, hopefully uh, I'm going to feel better. It's just speeding up my recovery, and uh, I'm obviously uh, uh, making my body a little bit, uh, you know, lighter. I would say, and 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 it just it just makes you feel better. It just kind of uh, it works kind of like a cold top. Well, it's a cryo sauna. Uh, the object is the player gets in. Uh, we. So with that in mind, Julio, I think there is potentially the use 
of such a strategy as a preparatory method pre-game? Yeah, in fact, uh, the effects on human body after uh, this type of temperature you know, of by cryogenic chambers are described not only in, in sports, in other populations as well. It's very interesting, this idea, because some physiological uh, variables are changing. We have to consider if the best moment is pre or after game, probably depends on the typical week. And I will consider another little detail more. The first experiences about the cryogenic chamber are very good responses on sleepness because there is a vagal response after this type of intervention. So we have to consider related to the capacity to get good sleepness on players, Steve. Uh, we think that, uh, which is the most uh, direct way in order uh, to get uh, seven hours and a half, eight hours every single day for this type of players. Definitely, and I think the late nights, the early mornings, the condensed travel schedule with games, and I think these all affect uh, the ability to sleep and potential health implications can be quite significant. Uh, recently, uh, Julio and I have been fortunate enough to work on some papers we've published in the uh, Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine, looking at an urgent wake-up call for the NBA. And we've previously published some work with some recommendations uh, on sleep for athletes. And what we also have looked at is that it's not necessarily just an issue for one particular sport, that sleep and sleep quality remains an issue for multiple sports across multiple different domains. And for us, I think one of the key areas here is noting from Dr. Medicine is that every aspect of athletic performance is affected um, by not getting enough sleep. And if you look at going back to, to Doc Rivers in his time at the Celtics, he reflects and says that you know, we're trying to win a championship. And if you're getting five to six hours of sleep a night, and that's just not good enough. If you go three to four to five days, then your reaction time is terrible. It's about winning championships. And to do that, we need to look at quality sleep. Our research with the Australian National NBL champions, the Perth Wildcats, allowed us to look at this particular team flying from the West Coast to the East Coast and back again throughout the first eight games of a very congested travel period. And what we were looking at really was this new term that has been uh, published a lot about recently of sleep hygiene, and specifically looking at trying to come up with a particular process that is your routine around sleep. And then the last part of that deals with the fact that, as we mentioned, there's a lot of health issues lately that have been described by players talking about the issues of a lack of sleep. And while most research and, and our focus has shifted towards this acute and chronic effects of sleep disruption, I think not only this is an area of problem Julio for players, but I do think this is an area that also has implication for coaches. Yeah, in fact, this is the new research line, Steve, about how we implement um, some different tools translating from other populations, commands, astronauts, um, translate to the sports, athletes in particular in basketball is, is the next target on, on future because uh, the lack of sleepness is probably the first biological recovery process, you know. So uh, in these uh, experiences based on scientific evidence, Madden, have you another anecdotal uh, report or have you the uh, situation with players uh, related to or, or something uh, about it? Yeah, what I can say, I can say from my from my experience, uh, you know, uh, let's start again from the pyramid when we say that is like uh, one third of the bottom of the pyramid should be like a proper sleep. I would say I would give 50% because I think that performance really, really uh, 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 is based on a, on a adequate uh, sleep. Uh, my experience, uh, which is really interesting to share with you, uh, like Olympic Games 2016 in Rio, the first thing that we did uh, when we came to the Olympic Village was to, to check the quality of beds and pillows. So we went, we went and we bought a couple of different types of pillows and we share between players and we gave them opportunity to choose. So they choose the adequate one for them 
And uh, I think that was really beneficial for us because the, the quality is not so good. And we said, if we need to sleep like a one third of the day, let's say at least eight hours, and if it's good, definitely we will benef benefit from there because also the experience from the Olympic games, uh, like uh, the highest level of athletes. But if I tell you, you know, that a lot of them, they, they eat in a McDonald's, uh, that was like uh, my impression, like definitely uh, if we sleep well, it will benefit for our performance. Uh, at the end of the Olympic Games, a lot of those players, our players, they took pillows and they brought with themselves because, you know, they, they adapted to them. And um, this is just a small digression. But uh, like with the team, uh, we try to, to suggest players, you know, to, to have a, a certain routine uh, once we get to the hotel. Uh, you know, uh, if we can keep the room dark, uh, if we can maintain the ideal, ideal temperature, uh, if we can split players to sleep by themselves, only one player if can stay in the room. You know, the problem with the budget, with the teams, you know, usually they put the two players. And, you know, some of them, you know, they want to communicate with, with their families in the States, like foreigner players, and it really disturbs the other player. And then they wake up in the morning, one player is nervous, say, oh, I didn't sleep until 2 a.m. because he was on Skype with his family. You know, a lot of, a lot of practical problems that we need to face when we talk about, about the sleep. Also, like playing away games and the home games. Would we, would we saw like some of the foreign players, you know, they perform better on the away games because they have a constant, constant nap. Because at home they need to wake up they need to, uh, you know, to bring the kids to the school and different, different problems that we face every, every day. Yeah, thank you for your comments. In our group, in fact, with Stephen and Mita and Charles and Thomas Hill, we are considered that on future we have included an expert on sleepness on teams. It's very important, this part of performance in order to get better recovery. Is there anything, uh, or a new concept in order to get a sleep extension during basketball performance, Steve? How yeah. is the management? Yeah, I think this is quite pertinent. And if you look at the initial work by Sherry Ma, where they looked at sleep extensions, the idea was to try and accumulate 10 hours of sleep. So if the players slept for seven hours, they would try and accrue another three hours during that 24 hour period. And most notably, when you look at pre-study, the athletes averaging around, and these are student athletes, averaging six and a half hours, but then post uh, when they were getting the sleep extension that increased to eight and a half. That improvement of two hours sleep in, in the playing group ultimately had an increase and improvement on court related activities. So sprint time, free throws, three point shooting, and then perceptual measures of alertness and mood and uh, sleepiness and fatigue were improved as well. So getting more sleep, so through some sleep extension, is very important. And I know with a lot of the teams in particular, especially if you are working with student athletes, they are often um, night owls. So we need to look at them retiring earlier and trying to optimize their sleep extension because this has a significant impact on their overall health and well being. Thanks so much, Steve. Very good detail in order uh, to consider. So we have to continue offer the exciting evidence to include in our packet, in our recovery back, because in future, uh, this type of uh, toys or tools, we don't know yet because uh, the secondary effects probably we will see in the next five, six years. We need to concrete more little details. Anything new about these topics, Steve? What should you consider to offer? Yeah, I think uh, in relation to recovery specifically, the, the main areas that are coming out now that are more novel are things like uh, flotation and sensory deprivation. And once again, I think if we consider the current environment with the levels of stress, both for athletes uh, competing and traveling repeatedly, where we take an opportunity for athletes just to take a time out, there's some very positive work coming out in the area of sensory deprivation. Uh, so I think that would be another area for us to continue to explore in the future. Um, 
I think that would be an area where there is a lot of opportunity to have a, an impact, especially currently given the, the psychosocial status around what's going on in the world. Excellent. Other topics, Steve, other things, other new ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think as we go forward with this, there's a few, a few main points for, for the listeners uh, and the viewers to take at the moment. Um, and those are really, if we have a look at what is supported by evidence uh, and the evidence supporting recovery, our main approach here would be there's still significant research that is warranted uh, in the field and being able to apply that specifically uh, to basketball settings. And, uh, and as Len has alluded to repeatedly throughout his experiences um, that he has provided, that there's no one size fits all across any group. We need to look at the strategies being applicable for the sports setting. So what is the context in relation to your organization and how can you go about engaging players individually within this process? And then finally looking at the combination of proactive strategies. So have you got recovery programmed within your training and the importance once again of the key principle of individualization. And then ultimately, once you have those areas in place, we then feel that to engage players in proactive recovery, we need to look at re results based. So what is the efficacy and how well does the strategy actually do what it's telling you it's going to do? A player-centered approach, so obviously in involving the players within the individualized, how do I look at recovery for a 15 year vet compared to a first year rook. And then once again, educating the players, have an education focus. So I think these areas are, are most important. Um, and before we, we, we finish off, I would just like to look at a, a player's voice in particular on the importance of putting it all together. It's all of that, to be honest, mate. Um, and I think that's the next part of, of being a professional that I've really dug into. And I'm trying to get the young boys to understand that, that it, it takes a lot for you to be able to look after your body the right way to give you the best possible chance to play at your best on, on the court. So it is food. Every time you sit down and have a meal, you're thinking in that training mindset. Um, you know, it's stuff before games where you're, you're putting yourself, your, your body warm it up the right way, activation stuff, triggering all the muscles necessary to, to go, um, Pilates before the games, all different kind of stuff, but but it is a lot, it is a lot to be honest, but um, you know, also on those recovery days, making sure we, we get what we need, so just because the game's over, you know, this process of looking after the body still happens when we, uh, when we step off the court. Excellent, excellent listen players, they are helping us, it's very important. And Madden, uh, in my opinion, include all these ideas into your back, transfer immediately in apply system on a court. And probably my final message and your final question is, we are talking about the personalized recovery. What is the future on the court when you are in front of the players? Oh, uh, definitely individualized, individualized uh, recovery is one of the of the of the main thing. Uh, we need to have an individual approach to every single player uh, because uh, none of them will recover on the same way. Some of them they need more time. Some of them will recover quicker. Also, the 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 team is not consisted, uh, you know, of the, of the the same individuals. You know, you have a you have a young guys, you have the old guys, you have a veterans. They prefer to do something. Uh, different from the young guys, you know, and they they are, they are in a comfort in their comfort zone. Uh, if they feel good in that comfort zone, I, I would not try for for any price to, to 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 change it. You know, maybe through some talk to try to give them opportunity. But if they don't choose it, I would stay. You know, in their comfort zone, if they perform well. If they don't perform well, then we need to talk and to, to try to change something. The young guys definitely to try to educate. We need to offer them as much as possible tools. But definitely, what you said, it must be science based. So, first of all, us, we need to be educated. We need to transfer that knowledge to the players. Uh, to have individual approach for every single player to involve them to put them 
to, to be proactive in recovery. So then they need to be present during recovery. They need to be aware of that process because it's something that is like through the whole day, is through the whole week, is through the whole month, through the, through the season and then through their career. Um, now we are, uh, we can see that today, you know, you have a players like a 35, 36, 40 years old and they maintain their body. They play on the highest level in a different league from Spain to Italy, Germany, which was amazing like 10 or 15 years ago to, to have a players like with this number of games, you know, uh, to play on such a high level. Uh, they play like a uh, fifth time in a row, they play like Olympic games, which is, which is amazing. So uh, this is a proof that they can, but you know, it must be, it must be something from our side just to, to offer them. Uh, the, the, the second slide that was uh, with the with the uh, recovery with the with the points. Definitely, we need to offer them like three, four, five, six different strategies. So, as soon as they as they leave the court, they should they should be uh, able, you know, to take something for a rehydration, uh, like a nutritional side, like metabolic recovery. Um, I like to call it like a flow model. So once they once they come into the locker room, from there they know exactly what they need to do. They go to the physiotherapist room. They they treat their soft tissue. They treat their body. Once they finish that, they get tape. They come to the weightlifting room again. They treat their body. After that, they come to the court. Once they finish the court, again on the same way, but the opposite side, they're coming back. They treat their body in the physio room. They release the muscles. They take um, liquids. Uh, okay, in Europe, we have a problem here with the budgets and organization, um, like also to have a meal. I, I think that just a couple of teams, they, they have, a, they have a, that approach. Uh, and then to do like ice baths, uh, even if they have cryotherapies, and then they can go home. I like to call like a, like a flow model, which is which is really good for them to understand that this is the process. It's not just okay, I do it because it's good. No, it's a process of taking care of your body, and you know to think about tomorrow, about the next uh, practice, about the next activity, the next game, next week, next month, and next next season. Thank you very much. Thank you both, Steve and Adrian. Big pleasure in the name of my mates of the Performance Advisor Board of the ELPA, Recovering Basketball from Science to Practice. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your knowledge. It for us is a big pleasure. And thank you for the, all the audience. And uh, I hope that this type of uh, events are um, better for increase our level in our profession and uh, to get a very best uh, basketball for the world. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.